Heavenly Father, you are holy, you are sovereign. We're so thankful for the rain that you have given us this week on a dry land and how it transforms and that reminds us of your mercy, God, the mercy that you have had with us, how the gospel reached our hearts dry and cracked and has produced in our life change, regeneration, and we're so thankful, Lord, for the transformation you have, you have done in each of us. And we're thankful to be here this morning to worship together and now to, to sit under your word together and let it transform our minds and change our hearts and convict us. Use it, Lord. Use it in our lives. Help us not to be only convicted, but to be encouraged as well to live our lives for you, to live our lives in a way that matters in eternity. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, turn with me to Colossians chapter 4 as we, continue, as we continue on. Now we're getting close to, to finishing the book. And I just, I'm just so thankful for this book that's been so practical, hasn't it? And it has really got down to the details of how we live for Christ, how the new man lives in each area of his life, how we should honor the Lord in different areas. And I hope today is also convicting to you as we look at our testimony and our witness. And I just want to start, we've all heard of the story of the Titanic, the unsinkable ship that was sunk by an iceberg on April 15th of 1912. And we know 2,240 people were on the ship. Over 1,500 people died on that, that night. But there's a story that you may not know of, of what happened on the Titanic. And it's the story of John Harper. He was a passenger on the Titanic who refused rescue so that he could share the gospel with as many people as he could before they would die. Listen to the story. When the Titanic hit the iceberg, Harper successfully led his daughter to a lifeboat. Being a widower, he may have been allowed to join her, but instead forsook his own rescue, choosing to provide the masses with one more chance to know Christ. Harper ran personed, to person, passionately telling others about Christ. As the water began to submerge the unsinkable ship, Harper was heard shouting, women, children, and the unsaved into the lifeboats. Rebuffed by a certain man at the offer of salvation, Harper gave him his own life vest saying, you need this more than I do. Up until the last moment on the ship, Harper pleaded with the people to give their lives to Jesus. The ship disappeared beneath the deep, frigid waters, leaving hundreds floundering in its wake with no realistic chance for rescue. Harper struggled through hypothermia to swim to as many people as he could, still sharing the gospel. Harper eventually would lose his battle with hypothermia, but not before giving many people one last glorious gospel witness. The last person he shared the gospel with before sinking into the deeps for the last time gave a witness of being saved by his testimony. It was the last convert of John Harper. And what a way to end your life. What a way to see life. Redeeming the time, taking the opportunity to share with as many people as possible. It's so easy to live our lives and to forget about the Great Commission, to forget what Christ left us to do, the task that He gave us that is still unfinished, to make disciples of all nations. Our text today in Colossians chapter 4, verses 5 and 6, talk about being a witness and our testimony. Let's read those verses. It says, Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, 
seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. In this passage, we see two essential aspects of our interaction with the world so that we may be used by God in the redemption of souls. First, we're going to see the walk in verse 5, and then we're going to see the talk in verse 6. But before we go into that, let's remember the greater context. Remember when we started the book of Colossians chapters 1 and 2, we were talking about deep theology, right? As Paul was countering or rebutting the false teachers that were coming in, trying to infiltrate the Colossian church. And he did that, giving us sound theology to understand the great truths in Christ. And the second part, in chapters 3 and now in 4, we see a practical application. He not only corrected the wrong theology and gave an answer to the false teachers, but he gave us a positive example. He tells us how to live the Christian life, a correct teaching on the new creation, how the new man should live. And he went from the, the general principles at the beginning of the chapter to the particulars, to the specifics. And he went from the general principles to how to live in each station in life. Remember, he gave instructions to husbands, to wives, to children, to parents. And then he started talking about prayer. Prayer was the last thing that we saw. And in that prayer, he asked that they would pray for him. And he talked about the opportunities that he's looking for to share the gospel. And he showed us a lifestyle of fulfilling the Great Commission. And now he turns to us and to the Colossians and is urging us to that same perspective, to that same lifestyle. The first part of this, the first verse here that we're going to look at, starts saying, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. And that phrase, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, really encompasses everything that we're going to look at today. You see, because there's a wisdom of the world, a worldly wisdom that we are all inclined to. It's our default. Worldly wisdom looks how to advance and protect our personal interest. As we go through life, we tend to look at things through the perspective of, how is this going to affect me? How is this going to affect my interest? And how is this, is this going to open me up? Or is this going to protect my interest? But the wisdom of God is different. It's based on how to advance His interest. And sometimes this comes at the expense of our own temporal interest. At least on a level here. Because we know in the end, everything that we do for Christ is going to be rewarded. But here on earth, to advance the kingdom of God, sometimes we have to set aside our own interest. Many times, actually. Our contact with unbelievers is the normative means that God uses to save people. God can save someone without the use of a believer. You know, we've all heard different testimonies of people that just, for example, started reading the Bible and the Lord saved them. But the normative way that God does it, the way he usually does it, is through other believers. Sharing the gospel. Living lives that are in accord with the gospel. And many times we don't give the attention that we should to this. That this is how God saves people. Because we just get wrapped up in living our lives and forget of the reason that God has us here on this earth. So let's look at these two verses. The first one is the walk, verse 5, that we could call the testimony. Walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of of the time. Is the opinion of unbelievers important? Why does God care what unbelievers think of us? 
Why should we care? Well, it is important. 1 Thessalonians 4, 11 and 12 says, Work with your hands so that you would walk properly before outsiders. It's something that is important. And in 1 Timothy 3, 7, we see that a good testimony with unbelievers, with the, the community, the watching world, is a requirement for being an elder. So this is very important to God, our testimony with the watching world. And you know, the Bible doesn't say that we are going to be accepted and honored by unbelievers. Quite the opposite. They're going to consider us foolish, ignorant, and many other things. But what we're talking about here is hypocrisy. If they consider us hypocrites, our testimony is worthless. Because what, how we live does not square up with what we proclaim to believe. The reputation of Christianity in the long term depends on the testimony of those who claim to be Christians. And so if you think of it like that, our job is even harder, right? Because there's a lot of people professing to be Christians that really aren't. And so their testimony isn't going to be what it should be. But let's get into this text. It says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders. We've already talked about that verb walk, right? We know it's our way of life, how we live day to day, how we live in the here and now, our conduct, our actions. Our life is either going to open doors or close doors to the gospel. To understand a little bit about this, you have to understand that Christians in the first and second century were misunderstood. Christianity was something new, was different than Judaism, and they really didn't know what it was. But it was, as it spread through the Roman Empire, it was misunderstood and slandered. Some of the things that were thought of Christians or Christians were accused of in that time was being atheist. They're like, well, that, that's kind of different. Why would Christians be accused of being atheists? Well, because there's no idol to worship. There's no visible deity. So to the pagan world, this, it was like, well, they must be atheists. Another one was of being unpatriotic because Christians refused to worship the emperor, which was part of the Roman Empire at that time. You were loyal to that empire and you you would offer, I think it was, you would burn incense to the emperor. And usually most people, they would just add this to their other many gods and to what they already believed. But Christians wouldn't do it for obvious reasons. And that would make them look as if they were unpatriotic. There was also rumors that Christians were immoral. Christians were under persecution, so they would many times would have to worship in secret behind locked doors, um, even in Rome there in the catacombs, underground, in the tombs. And so, of course, this led to people coming up with fancy ideas, imaginations about what was happening there, and slandering Christians for being immoral. And the last one was a misunderstanding of the Lord's table, and they were accused of being cannibals. So there was all this misunderstanding, all this slander. And what, what is necessary at a time like that? Well, what's always necessary, a clean testimony, a life that denies those, those claims, a life that professes, that is in accordance with the gospel. So testimony is crucial. Testimony, our lives can be an obstacle or a platform for the gospel. The way we live can be an obstacle or it can be a platform. Titus 2.10 says, Adorn the doctrine of God and Savior Jesus Christ. It's talking to slaves how they should live so that they would adorn the doctrine of Christ. When we live in a way that is blameless, when we live in a way that is wise, we are, as it were, embellishing, adorning, making the gospel 
look good because our lives show, show it in a good light. We are showing the effects that the gospel has had on us, and that elevates it. Let's also turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 5. Here in the Sermon on the Mount, we'll read from verses 13 through 16. Matthew chapter 5 it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Our lives can bring glory to God. And if you look in the verses we just read before that, what if the salt has lost, lost its saltiness? It's preserving effect. It's good for nothing. Our testimony is very, very important. And on the flip side, not only can our, our life adorn the gospel and glorify God, but it can also do something else. Titus 1.16, talking about false teachers, says, they profess to know God, but they deny Him by their works. Our works can deny God. You know, the world doesn't want to believe the gospel. The world is antagonistic to God, to the thought that they have to submit to Him. They have suppressed the knowledge of God, as it says in Romans chapter 1. And they want an excuse to discard our message. They're looking for it. People love to have a Christian that doesn't live the right way. And in their, in their whole life, they might meet one Christian. And if you try to share them the gospel, they'll say, well, let me tell you something. You know, I had a neighbor that was a Christian, and let, let me tell you how he lived. That's all it takes. They will hold on to that. And we don't want to be the ones that give them an excuse or become an obstacle for the gospel. Hendrickson says, it's as if the apostle is saying, behave wisely toward outsiders, always bearing in mind that though few men read the scrolls, all men read you. The closest some people are going to come to Christ they're not going to come to church. Many people are never going to step foot in church or read the scriptures, but they might know a Christian. And that's the opportunity that they would see Christ as how we live. They will read us. Um, a few years ago, I remember reading an obituary of a politician that had died. And something that impacted me is in the article it said, he was respected by his opponents. Those who, even those who disagreed with him because of his life, they disagreed with his views, with his values, with everything, but because of his character and his life, they respected him. And that's what we're looking for, right? The world is going to disagree with our gospel, totally. But our lives can be something that even those who disagree with us can respect. Now here it says that we should live in wisdom, walk in wisdom. And we know that Paul has brought up wisdom several times. It seems to be a theme in the book of Colossians. So let's look at some of these, these verses on wisdom just quickly to remember what part wisdom has played already in this epistle to the Colossians. In chapter 1 verse 9, he says, and so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord. So Paul prayed for wisdom that would help them to walk in a right manner 
worthy of the Lord. In verse 1, chapter 28, it says, Him we proclaim, warning and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. So he wants to teach and preach with all wisdom. Chapter 2, verse 3 says, in whom are hidden, talking about Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. The wisdom is from Christ. And in 3.16 it says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. So Paul's seeing that the Colossian believers need to be exhorted to be wise, to think about how they are living. They need spiritual wisdom. You know, you can live a holy life and not be wise. Wisdom goes beyond what's right and wrong. Of course, it's wise to do the right thing, to honor God, but wisdom goes beyond what's right and wrong and gets into the effect of what we do. See, there's things that aren't necessarily wrong in themselves, but would have a negative effect. And that's what we're talking about here. Say if you go to another culture. I was in Argentina this past week, and there's things that that people do there that would seem wrong here, and there's things people do here that would seem, seem wrong there. When I met other men in Argentina, they would give me a little peck on the cheek. That's something that you can do in Argentina, but it probably would not be a good idea to do it in Laredo. So there's things, there's times where there's things that aren't necessarily wrong, but we have to understand the situation and what would be the effect of doing that or not doing that. Things that we can neglect or do that could make us look inconsiderate or selfish. Wisdom of this sort requires attention on not only what we're doing, but what are the effects and how do other people see what we are doing. We have to interpret the circumstances and other people correctly. We have to understand expectations. How can we grow in wisdom, though, if you say, well, I want to be wise. I want to grow in that. How can we grow in this aspect? John MacArthur gives us a few pointers. One is by worship. Proverbs 9, 10 says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Wisdom comes from a right relationship with God, from a fearing Him and understanding Him as He is and His perspective on life. Also, by prayer, James 1.5 says, If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. So we need to ask God for this wisdom. He's the one that has it and can help us grow in it. Another one is Bible study. We just read in Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you with all wisdom, teaching, and admonishing one another. So where are we going to find wisdom? In God's word. And the last one is godly instruction. Colossians 1.28 says, Admonishing and teaching with all wisdom. Godly instruction is going to help us to become wise. So how are you walking towards unbelievers? How do unbelievers see you as you live your daily life? Does your life hold up the gospel? Does your your life say, I not only say this, I live it. I don't only say this and believe it, but you can see it in my life. Does it adorn the gospel? Ephesians 5.16 says, look carefully how you walk, not as unwise, but wise. We have to think about how we are living, how other people see our life. And the first step is paying attention. That verse said, look carefully. Watch. How are we relating to other people? We have to have that in our vision.
I think it's just a, it should be a goal for us that our lives would not deny Christ, right? That the way we live our lives. And we're going to see it's, it's definitely a challenge. The verse continues, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. So he's getting a little more specific. How are you going to walk wisely making the best use of the time? Literally, it says buying up the time, or some translations would say redeeming the time. It's, there's an opportunity there that we need to seize before it is gone. Mole says, securing each successive occasion of witness and persuasive example at the expense of steady watchfulness. So the idea is somebody that's watching to see opportunities as I go through my life to be a witness for Christ. Not just with my words, as we're going to see in a minute, but with my life. There's so many things that the Bible tells us to do that if we do, we will stand out from those around us. Do everything without grumbling and complaining. Wow, just that in itself. It's so natural to grumble. Everybody's grumbling. Everybody's complaining. But when somebody isn't doing that, it's like, what, what's going on here? It's a testimony. Redeeming the time. Time is arguably the most valuable thing that we have, isn't it? You can't buy more time. There's a day when we are all going to die. And we can't buy more time. We can't extend that. No matter how much money we have. Time is life. Our life is measured in years, and months, and days, and weeks, and minutes. It's our life. As, as time goes by, that is getting smaller and smaller. So if our life is measured in time, time is life for us. And once time is wasted, once it's gone, we can't get it back. We can't go back and redeem time that has already passed. We can only work with the present. And even the world realizes this. A productivity guru said, time is our most valuable asset, yet we tend to waste it, kill it, and spend it rather than invest it. But we don't need the world to tell us that because we already know from the Word. Psalm 90 verse 2 says, So teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. We need to recognize that time is a limited resource. It's a precious thing. And really, if we, if we think about it, we don't have a lot of time to work with, right? We spend a lot of time sleeping because we, we need that. We spend a lot of time working because we have to work as well. That's how God has made us. So when you take out the things that you have to do, the amount of time that you really have at your disposal isn't that much. But how we use that time is going to determine if we live or don't live for the Lord Jesus. So it is a limited resource that we have to steward wisely. John chapter 9 verse 4, Christ says, We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no man can work. Jesus had a sense of urgency. And we also have a limited amount of time in which to do the will of God, in which to do God's work. And we don't know. John Harper on, on the Titanic, he knew that his time was short. He knew that people were going to die that night. But we don't know. We don't know when our time is going to come. So we don't know how much we have, and therefore, we need to use it wisely. How do we redeem it? How do we buy it back from being lost? This is talking about opportunities. Opportunities with the unsaved. It's talking about opportunities that we take and opportunities that we make. Making and taking opportunities. And the first thing is we need to pray for opportunities. Paul just before in chapter, well in verse 3, actually in chapter 4 verse 3, pray at the same time also pray for us 
that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ. Paul's asking them, pray that I would have opportunities for the gospel. Pray that I would have opportunities to share the gospel. And we also must be praying for opportunities, but also we must make opportunities. One is our testimony, right? The way we live. The way we live is going to create opportunities for the gospel. When someone asks us, why are you always happy? Why are you never, never seem to be worried? Or, or why do you live in this way? Why do you do this? Opportunities for the gospel. Another is just being aware, watching for the opportunities. So many opportunities slip away because we're not looking for them. We're not watching for them. There's many times that we have opportunities or can create opportunities for the gospel, or at least to start talking about those kind of things, asking questions. You know, sometimes we think we just have to share the gospel, and it's so, it seems so intimidating and so awkward because it's like, I just want to throw out the gospel there. But what about questions? We can learn more about other people and get to talk about spiritual things if we would just take some time to ask questions and have conversations that may not be sharing the gospel, but that are starting to go towards spiritual things and trying to understand their perspective of life, of eternity, of death. Things that will lead to us being able to talk about the gospel. And the other is taking the opportunities, right? Sometimes we see the opportunities and we don't take them. Taking the opportunities requires humility, requires being vulnerable, right? So we're putting ourselves sometimes, we don't know what they're going to think about what we are telling them. And it requires grace, as we're going to see in the next, next verse. It requires thinking in advance about how we're going to talk about these things. So the idea is that we don't know what tomorrow will bring, and we should be making the best use of time in relation to witnessing to others. So this is our walk and perspective on opportunities. But now we're going to t- talk about our talk, or our witness. The next verse says, Let your speech always be gracious. Let your speech always be gracious. What are we talking about here, that our speech would be gracious? Some see this as just being um, pleasant, attractive, charming, or winsome. Our speech should be nice, should be pleasant, should be easy to listen to. But it's more than that. If we turn to Ephesians chapter 4, in Ephesians chapter 4, we have a verse that, that would help us understand a little more what it's trying to say here. Ephesians 4.29 Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion, that it may give grace to those who hear. So the type of speech that we should have, our gracious speech, is the opposite of corrupting or unwholesome speech, which obviously talks about the words and the way that we say it. Our speech should be for edifying, for building up, not for tearing down. It's a speech that imparts grace. It says that it may give grace to those who hear. It imparts the grace of God. And we need a lot of wisdom to know how to speak in this gracious and edifying way. This speech is the opposite of what it says in verse 31 of the same chapter. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. It's talking about Not only the words that we say, but how we say them. And this chapter also tells us how we should speak. If you look up in verse 15, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. So our gracious speech is a speech that is motivated and guided by love. When we say things, how we say things, what we say should be guided by love and graciousness. And you know, God knows the testimony that this type of speech is going to have in a world. 
where this is not common. In a world where the, the most common thing is to tear other people down or to use our speech to manipulate other people and get what we want. You see, gracious speech de-escalates difficult situations and different disagreements. Proverbs says, a soft word turns away wrath. And gracious speech is going to have a greater impact because it's not the way that we speak that's going to be offensive. It opens the door for our message to have a greater impact on the people that are listening. Going back to our verses here, we are not only to have gracious speech, but it says, let your speech always be gracious. Always. How hard this is, right? Because there's some people that we naturally speak graciously to. But it's saying always, at all times and with all people, it should be gracious. At home, at work, with trying people, under stress, under persecution, on social media, our speech should be gracious. Should impart the grace of of God. And you say, well, that, that's, that's impossible. Well, most of the things that God asks us to do are impossible apart from His Spirit. And it's not to say that we are going to do it perfectly, but this is what we are called to. Look at Christ, Luke 23, 34. Jesus on the cross, speaking of the soldiers that are at His feet, that have crucified Him. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. Great, gracious, gracious speech. And the verse we just saw in, in 4.15, Ephesians 4.15 says to speak the truth in love. This is not that we're never going to speak hard truths. Don't misunderstand me. It's that even when we speak hard, hard truths, even when we confront, it's done in this manner, in a manner that honors Christ. Our verse continues, let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt. And we know salt had several uses in in olden times, right? Not only to flavor food as we use it for now, but to preserve, to preserve food. So what 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 is it talking about here? Some consider it to mean more along the lines of flavoring that our speech would have a certain flavor, that it would be thought-provoking, that it would be worthwhile, not dull, says Hendrickson. Or the New American Commentary, that it's seasoned, that it's acceptable, that it's not offensive, just like it's easier to eat food that's seasoned than food that's bland. Our words should be easy to listen to, easy to accept because of the way that we are speaking But some others also go beyond that and say that it's also our words should be have a preserving nature. They should be a restraint to decay, to corruption. MacArthur says that we should our conversation should turn the conversation from corrupting things to spiritual things. We've all been in conversations that were going well, and all of a sudden we ended up talking about things that probably shouldn't be talked about or weren't of good taste, or weren't of benefit, weren't edifying. Saying our words should be seasoned with salt and that we should be the ones taking the conversation to spiritual things, to edifying things, and not things that are corrupt. And I think really there's there's truth in both of these. I think think that Paul was using the, the salt illustration here to tell us it should be a good flavor to our speech, but it also should have a preserving effect. And our verse finishes saying, that you may know how you ought to answer each person. That you may know how you ought to answer each person. Turn with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 3. First Peter 3, 14 and 15. But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, 
always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect. Answering each person. First of all, we have to realize that the context here is suffering unjustly. He's saying, if you suffer, if you're treated like a criminal for righteousness' sake, if you're under persecution, then this is how you're going to answer for the hope that is in you. And it relates to when we live our lives in the right way, there's opportunities to speak. Like as in this verse, when you're, when you're suffering unjustly and there's a hope within you, people are going to be like, hey, why do you have this hope? You're suffering unjustly. You didn't do anything wrong. And this is how you're going through it with hope and not sinning. And they're going to ask you, why are you doing that? And that goes back to the way we are living our lives. But to speak, to know how to answer here doesn't just talk about the words we are to say, but it's talking about how. Because the context of what we're talking about here in, in Colossians is the wise, gracious, and salty speech. So we need wisdom in order to, to answer in this gracious way in these trying circumstances, how to answer each person. We need to understand the person we are talking to in order to speak graciously to them and have a witness. New American Commentary says, Christian graciousness and sensitivity to the person and the situation. The person and the situation. How to speak appropriately based on each situation, each person that we are talking with. So we need to ask ourselves now, is, is my life, is my speech an aroma of Christ to those around me? Is the way that I speak, is the way that I conduct myself an aroma of Christ? Am I different from the world? Because I should be. I live according to a totally different set of values. Am I different to the people I work with? Am I different to the people in the gym? Am I different to my unsaved family members? Is my speech gracious and sweet? It's a challenge. It's a challenge to be a Christian in an unsaved world, isn't it? It's a challenge to live wisely. Because we tend to go just into survival mode and just to blend in and not try to draw unnecessary attention or opposition to ourselves. But Christ is worth more than that. We should walk in wisdom and speak in wisdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, it's a convicting passage here. It's a challenge to live as Christ lived that others would see Christ in us, that our words would be gracious, Lord. It's so easy to get frustrated with people, to answer, har answer harshly, to be annoyed. But you call us to a greater, a greater degree of Christ-likeness. You call us to a greater, a higher standard, a conduct and a speech that is consistent with the gospel. Help us to live this out this week. In Jesus' name, amen.